Perfect. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for, for to Joe and Neil for organizing this event. And as Fiona yesterday put it so well, reminding us that there is an intellectual world beyond our, our living rooms. Um, and so the occasion is, is very welcome. And thanks very much for, for inviting me. Um, so let me begin with an, with an apology to those of you who have read my little book, Relativism in the Philosophy of Science, published by CUP last December. If the conference had taken place as originally planned, this talk would have preceded the publication of the book. But the pandemic kind of messed up that, that um, schedule. And I've not worked on the topic, on this topic, um, since the publication on the book. So all I can do really here is to give something of a summary of two chapters um, of the book. OK, my talk has six parts. I will first say something general about how to study epistemic relativism in the philosophy of science. I will then introduce epistemic relativism as I understand it and identify some of its essential elements in Kuhn, Feyerabend, Geary, Chang, and Van Frasen. And I will spend more time on Van Frasen than on the others. And in particular, I shall lay out the relativism of the empirical stance and then offer a critical evaluation. And in section six, I will summarize my results. Okay, the natural starting point is the following thing that worries me um, when I think about relativism, namely the general concern whether thinking about relativism in general and relativism in the philosophy of science isn't passé. Um, that it is passé was suggested, for example, by the distinguished historian of science who claims that relativism belongs with, quote, all the other goblins let loose by Kuhn's structure of scientific revolution, um, goblins that at least amongst historians of science, she says today, quote, elicit barely a yawn. Well, is Rainy Dustin right? Are the historians of science right to yawn when hearing of relativism? Are you right to yawn under those circumstances? Well, maybe not. Um, you might wonder, for example, whether the debate recently triggered only a couple of years ago by um, Errol Morris's book on Kuhn, The Ashtray, whether those sorts of debates show that there is still some mileage even in Kuhn's goblins um, to, get, to get excited about. But even leaving uh, Dustin and Kuhn to one side, there's also another group of thinkers that sometimes worry me when we discuss relativism, because especially younger colleagues often complain that today's action simply lies elsewhere with wonderful topics like structural realism or perspectival realism or pluralism or models or Bayesianism or science policy or historicism. Those are the topics that most get most attention nowadays at PSA or EPSA conferences, not relativism. Well, I agree, of course, um, that um, those are the topics that attract most attention currently at conferences. But still, I remain unconvinced that relativism has thereby become obsolete. Think, for example, of how pluralists or perspectivalists accuse each other of being relativists. Michaela finds Geary guilty of relativism. Harry Longinot finds John Dupre um, guilty of, of relativism. And Tasok Chang sometimes criticizes relativism, sometimes defends it. Moreover, relativism regularly resurfaces in many of these, debate, of these debates only in different terminology. In many of the debates that are nowadays had about pluralism in the old days, let's say 20, 30 years ago, would have come broadly under the heading of relativism. Last but not least, let's not forget that there is a vibrant and politically dangerous post-truth debate out there, and that relativistic themes play a crucial role in many of those debates. OK, let us agree then, at least for the moment, that relativism is still worth looking at. Um, but then the next question arises, if relativism still is relevant, and if one, like me, is willing to explore its potential in a sympathetic fashion, 
how should one go about doing so? How should one go about developing and possibly defending certain forms of relativism? Well, surely the first thing one should do is to be clear about what one actually means by relativism. One should spell out the, if you like, the spectrum of relativist position and distinguish between defensible and indefensible versions. And this is something that I would do in a moment. A second project, a second project one might pursue is to identify card carrying relativists in the past and present and to defend and develop their positions. In my book on relativism and the philosophy of science, I do so for the sociology of scientific knowledge. And I have two other books in preparation, one on Georg Simmel, in my view, the first really substantive and sophisticated uh, 20th century um, relativist, and the other on Wittgenstein, which have a similar agenda of going back to a figure of the past and making sense of the relativist commitments. Third, one might also defend relativism in a more roundabout way. That is, having laid out what one means by relativism, one might then go on to show that some well-established positions in the philosophy of science fall squarely within the relativist spectrum, even if their proponents have not acknowledged as much. And this is what I will do in the main part of this talk with respect to von Frasen. Um, of course, there's also a fourth project, um, and this would be to start developing one's relativism from scratch. And this is what typically happens or has happened anyway in 20th century um, philosophy and anthropology. And of course, good luck to those who want to try. I must say, for my own case, I found the first three projects excitement enough. I'm also not convinced of the idea of starting afresh and ignoring the previous work. Although it has been largely invisible in the previous literature, and usually relativism is treated as simply an, a simple mistake rather than a tradition of thought, well, there is in fact a rich and complex history of relativist thinking, and present-day relativists, in my view, ignore this history at their peril. Well, let me conclude these tentative introductory remarks by saying something general on why we should be interested in the relativism absolutism debates. In my view, these debates raise fundamental questions about our relationship to the world and to our communities and traditions. It raises questions like, what can we cognitively hope to achieve? Can we transcend the human perspective? Remember James's talk from, from yesterday. And what does it mean to transcend the human perspective? What do we owe to each other and to our cultural scientific traditions? What cognitive diversity is there and how should we respond to it? Or where do our absolutist or our relativist intuitions come from and how should we deal with them? I don't think we can simply set these questions to one side. They seem to me at the very heart of philosophical um, engagement with ourselves and the world, and of course with science. Okay, so much for the very brief introduction. I now want to turn to explaining how I understand epistemic relativism, or more specifically, the spectrum of views one might call epistemic relativism. The first key commitment of epistemic relativism is a principle I call dependence. It says that a belief has an epistemic status, for example, the status of being epistemically justified or being knowledge, only relative to epistemic standards, be those standards rule-like rule -like entities or be there as in Kuhn, for example, precedents, paradigms. A second key commitment is plurality. According to this principle, there is or has been or could be more than one set of epistemic standards in the same domain. And these standards of different sets can conflict, can lead to different verdicts. 
The third commitment of epistemic relativism is conflict. It says that epistemic verdicts based on different set of standards sometimes exclude one another. This can either happen, A, because the two set of standards license incompatible answers to the same question, or B, because the advocates of one set of standards find the answers suggested by the advocates of another set of standards unintelligible. Condition B is needed to capture situations of Kuhnian incommensurability. The fourth principle is conversion. Switching from one set of standards as one to another set of standards as two is sometimes underdetermined by S1 plus evidence plus prior beliefs and is experienced by the switches as something of a leap of faith. The fifth commitment is the most complex and indeed the sine qua non of the relativist position. This is its heart. It allows for, a, in fact, it allows for a choice between different strengths of relativism. I call the overall, the umbrella principle, sym symmetry, not to be confused with the symmetry principle in the sociology of knowledge, which is mainly a methodological form of relativism. This is not what I'm presenting here. So it says that different sets of standards S are symmetrical in that they are, option one, based on nothing but local contingent and varying causes of credibility call this symmetry as locality, or B, impossible to accept, to rank except on the basis of a specific set of standards, call this symmetry as non-neutrality, or option three, option C, they are impossible to rank since the evaluative terms of one set of standards are inapplicable to another set of standards, call this symmetry as non-appraisability. Or option four, the different sets of standards are equally true or equally valid. Call this symmetry as equal validity. Let me say a little bit more about these different elements of symmetry. What I call locality rejects absolutist commitments such that there is a unique set of standards that ought to be accepted by every rational being, that enables us to capture truths that are there anyway, as both Bogosian and Timothy Williamson like to put it, um, that would be accepted by an ultimate final science. Um, and of course, there can be further, um, there can be further versions of absolutism that are ruled out by, by locality. But note, locality allows that the proponents of one set of standards can legitimately criticize the standards of another set of standards. Thus, locality cannot be naturally combined with non-appraisability or with equal validity. But locality can go together, of course, with the principle of symmetry as non-neutrality. Now, I've spoken in passing of defensible and indefensible versions of epistemic relativism. And symmetry, it seems to me, the different versions of symmetry allows me to draw the distinction in the following way. In my view, indefensible versions of relativism favor non-appraisability and equal validity across the board. And thus, it is not so, it, because I find this an indefensible version, I'm, I'm I'm confirmed in holding this view by the fact that almost all refutations of relativism target these elements, non-appraisability and equal validity. But the important thing for us to note here and to take away is this, all of the best known self-professed relativists deny being committed to non-appraisability and equal validity. Lauren Coe denies it, David Bluer denies it, Paul Feyerabend denies it, Hartree Field denies it, Mark Weisgott denies it, or for example, the historical figure of Georg Simmel denies it. And if you look at Christopher Herbert's a fascinating book, Victorian Relativity, which looks at different versions of influentially, uh, influential version of relativism in the second half of the 19th century, primarily in the British context, 
You also find him repeatedly insisting that no one there ever thought that relativism was essentially linked to equal validity. Well, not everyone agrees with me in insisting on this point. For instance, the 2019 book by Maria Bagramian and Annalisa Koliva criticizes me for allowing forms of relativism without equal validity as a necessary condition. Bagramian and Koliva worry that, amongst other things, that too many positions end up counting as relativistic if one follows my way of laying out the position. Well, maybe so, but I look at it differently. I think it's only fair to let the writings of the most sophisticated card-carrying relativists determine what the term relativism means. And if that procedure ends up with a wider extension for the term epistemic relativism, then so what? So much the better. Okay, as I said, the main topic of my talk will be van Trasen's position, but at least in passing, I want to say just a few words about Kuhn, Feyerabend, Geary, and Chang, and relate them to my definition of relativism. It seems to me that all four accept dependence, that is that epistemic status depends on the set of standards. All four also accept plurality, but with different emphasis. Kuhn is a synchronic monist, but a diachronic pluralist. Feyerabend is a pluralist in both dimensions, and so is Geary. Chang is committed to plurality, not as a descriptive thesis primarily, but primarily as a normative program. Kuhn and Feyerabend are of course committed both to forms of conflict, conflicting answers to the same questions or unintelligible questions in the other paradigm, and both defend conversion explicit, explicitly, it's their term. While Geary rejects talk of semantic incommensurability, he still accepts incompatibilities between perspectives, even in the same domain. Chang finally deems it an open question whether semantic or methodological incommensurability play a role. Finally, as far as symmetry is concerned, there's no indication that any of the four authors supports equal validity. But they do accept something like non-neutrality and perhaps locality. Now, I have said um, nothing here about uh, Michaela's perspectivism and how it relates to relativism with or without equal validity. This is not because I deem uh, Michaela's perspectivism less important or less ingenious than the positions I presented. I here leave it aside simply because Michaela will present her own talk tomorrow and also because my former colleague, Natalie Ashton, has already discussed um, Michaela's perspectivism very much from a perspective of relativism without equal validity. So I recommend um, Natalie's um, paper to you, and of course, also Michaela's uh, response. Okay, I now turn to Van Frasen's position in the empirical stance. Let me acknowledge up front that I'm not, of course, the first person to discuss Van Frasen's book as a form of relativism. Indeed, some of the people who are here now or were here yesterday have done likewise, especially James Ladyman and Paul Teller. I also recall many discussions of these issues with Anjan Chakrabarti and with the late Peter Lipton. I will not, however, engage with these, with these interpretations here, but I'm happy to do so in the, in the Q&A. As I said, I'm here primarily concerned with the empirical stance and closely related papers um, pretty much up to the, to the present. In my book, I also spent some time discussing von Frasen's, in my view, opus magnum, scientific representation, as well as early writings, but I leave that aside here. Now, of course, some of you might wonder at this point whether a 20-year-old semi-popular book is still worthy of our attention today. Well, perhaps the doubters should simply take my talk as an exercise in the history of the philosophy of science then, if they feel so strongly about it. But then it's a history of philosophy of science with the intention to still contribute something to today's concerns. Okay, Van Frasen's position in the empirical stance can be divided into four interacting components, a view on stances, a voluntarist theory of rationality, 
a voluntarist epistemology, and a theory of scientific revolutions. Um, I shall first explain the four components separately before then relating them to one another. So I begin with the stances. As you probably know, von Frasen is adamant that empiricism is primarily not a doctrine, but a stance. Um, as it is a set of what I call VEPs, namely virtues, values, emotions, preferences, and policies, rather than doctrines. The reasons for reinterpreting empiricism in this way are tricky, and I'm not going to get into this here. It's not important for my talk. Um, in the case of empiricism, the sort of um, virtues and values and preferences that are important to von Frasen are, quote, disvaluing of explanation by postulate, calling us back to experience, a rebellion against theory, admiration for science, and an ideal of rationality that does not bar disagreement. Okay, then a few words on the voluntarist theory of rationality. Voluntarism is the name for a theory of rationality that gives will and decisions a central place. One might also call it decisionism. Van Frasen tells us that the fundamental norm of rationality is, quote, to avoid self-sabotage, unquote, to avoid reasoning that even by our own lights prevents us from reaching our goals. Van Frasen takes this to mean that we must avoid logical inconsistency and probabilistic incoherence, and thus commit to, as he calls them, principles of rationality, that is, deductive logic, the theory of probability, and the practical syllogism. Call these what he calls principles of rationality, rationality in the narrow sense. Now, von Frasen credits William James with the insight that rationality in the narrow sense underdetermines many of our epistemic choices. Uh, he also uh, finds the work of, of Carnap here importance, uh, the lambda parameter, but let's, 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 let's leave that aside. Simply put, we each have to exercise our will, that is to decide to set our risk quotients. For example, do we primarily seek to avoid false positives or primarily to avoid uh, false negatives? Do we set the hurdle for justification high or low? We all do so, be it reflectively or spontaneously, with regards to changing circumstances or not. Rationality in the narrow sense does not come with criteria that would give us unique answers to these questions. This is where webs become important. We have to decide, say, whether in general or in a given situation, the potential harm from false positives is greater than the potential harm from false negatives. Deciding this question involves value judgments. This suggests that stances for von Frasen are not just important in meta philosophy as a theory about what philosophical positions like empiricism are. Stances are also significant for understanding our choices and commitments as epistemic and moral agents. Von Frasen applies his voluntarism not just to the theory of rationality, but also more specifically to epistemic rationality. And here he defends a position called voluntarist epistemology. We do get to voluntarist epistemology if we focus on possible answers to the following two questions. A, should epistemology be closely intertwined with and thus built upon the sciences of the day? Or B, should epistemology have a wide scope? That is, should it leave few, if any, areas of the epistemic realm unconstrained and unregulated? And Alfred Frasen draws the following distinction, objectifying epistemology, of which naturalized epistemology is the most important instance, objectifying epistemology responds yes to both questions. Whereas von Frasen's own voluntarist epistemology answers no to both questions. Now, all of the components 
tells us about scientific revolutions. Um, Van Frasen argues in favor of his conception of rationality by invoking a Kuhnian conception or Feyerabendian conception of scientific revolutions with incommensurability, crisis, despair, essential role for values, theoretical and otherwise, and radical breaks. One key question for Van Frasen is how the new paradigm can ever become a live object. And for Van Frasen, the answer lies with despair and emotions or similar impulses, as he also says. Van Frasen's thinking about emotions here is strongly influenced by Sartre. Sartre, not a figure that often appears in the philosophy of science. Van Frasen uses Kafka's metamorphosis as an example. Gregor Samsa is an ordinary young bureaucrat living with his parents and sister Greta. One night in his sleep, um, he turns into a gigantic beetle, unable to communicate with humans. His family is shocked. At first, he tries to continue with normal life, treating the beetle as Gregor. Alas, this quickly turns out to be impossible. Gregor the beetle's needs and actions are simply too opaque, unpredictable, and absurd. Amidst the growing desperation, Greta, the sister, suffers a mental breakdown, despair. This impulse changes the way the family perceives the beetle, not as Gregor, but as a creepy animal that has destroyed and replaced their son. And this new perception made possible by the impulse then justifies killing the insect. The change in the family's thinking um, because of Greta's breakdown can be captured in the following terms that fit with essential claim von Frasen makes about scientific revolutions. Throughout the whole episode, the parents and Greta stick to one and the same rule, namely protect your family members. But before Greta's breakdown, the rule was interpreted or used in a conservative way in that the domain of the rule was not changed when Gregor turned into a beetle. After Greta's emotional outburst, protect your family members was rendered in a revolutionary way. The domain of the rule was now changed so as to exclude Gregor. In the case of scientific revolutions, Van Frasen explains, the change in the use of a rule of method goes as follows. His example is the empiricist stricture, sola experientia, roughly, let sensory experience be the sole yardstick. Defenders of the old paradigm, P1, insist that sola experientia provides a justification for P1, and that P1 does not go beyond experience in illegitimate ways. In other words, the proponents of P1 use sola experientia in a conservative way. The revolutionaries promoting P2 make the same claim for P2, mutatis mutandis. At the same time, they claim to be able to identify metaphysical baggage in P1, excess structure that is not licensed by experience. Think of Newton's notion of absolute space, Van Frasen suggests. The defenders of P2 thus employ sola experientia in a revolutionary way. Van Frasen takes his account of scientific revolutions to support his voluntarism. The crucial test for epistemologies, according to the empirical stance, is whether or not they can safeguard the rationality of science and progress while accepting as inevitable the, animals, uh, the, the elements of impulse and conversion at the very core of scientific revolutions. Voluntarist epistemology does best in these regards, Van Frasen claims, and this is because it is minimalist. First, the minimalism leaves room for impulses and conversions. Second, voluntarist epistemology is not tied to specific paradigms. And third, since voluntarist epistemology 
is minimalist and not tied to specific paradigms and does not change during revolutions, it can function as something of a stable backdrop of rationality. It's the only form of rationality that need not change. Van Frasen takes his account of, wait, uh, Van Frasen takes his account of sign, oh, wait, yeah, okay, let me now turn to a, to a critical um, evaluation. I again focus on the different elements of the overall structure. And to begin with, I want to home in on the specific character of Van Frasen's relativism, if I'm then right to attribute this position to him. Above, relativism was interpreted as a doctrine concerning the relationship between sets of epistemic standards. That's the, the standard rendering I gave you in my section two. But now it seems that we can replace the elements that are here um, given in red or blue with stances. So let's play through these different options. There are three ways we can do this. First of all, we can deal with, we can treat relativism as a doctrine about how to conceive of the relation between different epistemic standards. The um, webs then play the role of standards. But relativism may itself also be thought as a stance concerning the relationship between different sets of standards, where these standards are as traditionally conceived. And finally, we can also think of relativism as a second order stance concerning first order epistemic stances. And it seems to me that it is the last position that is most naturally attributed to von Frasen. Now I might ask why conceptualize relativism as a stance? Well, it would for instance allow one to say that what unites many authors accused of or happily embracing forms of relativism is first and foremost a rebellion against absolutist forms of metaphysics, epistemology, or ethics. Many relativists also share further values or virtues. They oppose intellectual imperialism and value epistemic humility or tolerance. Perhaps focusing on these sentiments allows us to identify better a tradition of relativist thought that remains invisible as long as we concentrate only or primarily at doctrines. Of course, in order for these stances to qualify as relativism, they would then have to embody commitments akin to the five elements introduced in my section two. All of which brings me to my key question, does von Frasen's theory of stances qualify as a form of relativism? I think so. And it's natural to conceive of relativism as in fact closely aligned with the empiricism. But there are certainly clear relativist themes in von Frasen's conception of stances. For instance, he speaks of conversion in that context. He says, being or becoming an empiricist is similar or analogous to conversion to a cause, a religion, an ideology. He also links the theory of stances to what one might call permissivism, quote, an ideal of rationality that does not bar disagreement. There is more than one rational response to a given body of evidence. Relativism in itself, of course, is then a stance. It's committed to valuing fundamental disagreements that can rationally persist until and unless one side converts to the other side. Now, turning from stances to von Frasen's voluntarism, let me be a little more explicit how best to reconstruct it. Remember that von Frasen's view is layered. There are principles of rationality that help one to avoid self-sabotage, logic, probability, uh, practical syllogism. And then there are values, virtues, emotion, policies, preferences. Now, the, the lower part, the principles of rationality, logic, and probability, 
are four von Phrasen rationally without alternative. They are absolute and they are minimalist. I previously called that narrow rationality. But the upper parts, the values, uh, virtues, emotions, preferences, and policies uh, do have rational alternatives. That's the realm of relativity, if you like. And that realm is not minimalist, but expansive. And it's only we get to wide rationality when we combine those two layers. And finally, let me emphasize an element which I've not that much emphasized before, namely that this is all meant to be not a descriptive, but a prescriptive theory of rationality. Now, I've talked about um, von Frasen's um, uh, relativism as far as the theory of stances and isolation is concerned. But of course, it's also clear that von Frasen's theory of of scientific revolutions has clear relativist features. After all, conversion is essential element. There are rational alternatives. There are radical reinterpretations of epistemic rules. All those elements that, that fit with a conception of relativism in the philosophy of science as it has become influential uh, following Kuhn and Feyerabend. I also would want to emphasize here that voluntarism and relativism are closely intertwined. Von Frasen's position in the empirical stance clearly is in the relativist spectrum as far as the voluntarism is concerned. There's dependence, there's plurality, there's conflict, there's conversion, and at least there's symmetry as locality. I would argue that these themes can also be found in the scientific image and in scientific representation as I've tried to argue um, in my book, but I will not go into this topic here. Okay, so far I've presented, I've taught to reconstruct um, Van Frasen's position as best I can. Um, I now want to turn to some um, critical um, comments. Um, but my critical comments are not from an anti relativist position. Um, this is very much the perspective from which Lady Man Lipton, Teller, or Chakrabarti um, criticized um, Van Frasen or used to criticize Van Frasen. But I want to criticize him from a, from a perspective that is open to the relativism, but still finds aspects of his view um, problematic. So let's first begin with stances. Stances are indeed an intriguing addition to the arsenal of the historian of philosophy and the philosopher of science. Um, and stances come with a novel template for thinking about relativism. To start with the history of philosophy, surely many isms are indeed fruitfully taken as bundles of webs. We think of Feyerabend's epistemological anarchism, seems to me the, the clearest um, case in point. And relativism itself can be viewed as a stance since most relativists are rebelling, as I said, against absolutist form of metaphysics, oppose intellectual humility and so on. Now, admittedly, the existence of stances will be news more to philosophers than to historians of science. Historians of science have already, are already open to the possibility that intellectual movements are held together as much by webs as by doctrines or beliefs. It's also worth adding that when it comes to understanding the unity of a philosophical tradition, it is difficult, if not impossible, to decide whether the primary unifying link are webs or beliefs. Determining the relative importance of webs and beliefs is also difficult in the sciences. That webs play a crucial role in science has been amply documented in feminist historical and sociological scholarship. Kuhn, for instance, draws attention to the values of accuracy, consistency, scope, simplicity, and truthfulness and I will come back to her, Helen Longino has her own set of, 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 of values. Uh, now, if stances are, go are going to be more than just a fancy new, new terminology um, for familiar phenomena, then we need to be told how they are to interact with other analytical categories, um, such as paradigms, research traditions, or research schools. Further reflection on this call might well lead to a better understanding of relativism. After all, conflict, plurality, and conversion 
seem easier to make sense of when it comes to values and preferences than application to principles or practices. After all, in our 21st century multicultural societies, we all have had plenty of experiences with fundamental disagreements over values. Okay, then let me say something about, about the voluntarist theory of rationality. To repeat, Van Frasen's conception of rationality is layered. The lower stratum consists of universal and absolute principles of rationality, the higher stratum of the relative and variable depths. Um, now we can put pressure on this theory by noting that absolute principles of rationality are definitionally interdependent with values. Self-sabotage, consistency, coherence, are values captured or secured by the principles. Van Frasen takes these values to be without alternative and gives a specially strong position to consistency. Now, his proceeding in this way allows me to make a terminological distinction. I shall call Van Frasen's position a voluntarism with an absolute base or a moderate form of voluntarism. And as soon as we, as we have formulated what we mean by moderate voluntarism, we can also immediately introduce a radical voluntarism. A radical voluntarism is a relativism that goes all the way down. There is no special privilege for consistency. Now, von Frasen seems to think that in developing all this, he's close to Kuhn as far as voluntarism is concerned. And recall that the later Kuhn speaks of shared epistemic values, like the earlier cited one, like accuracy, consistency, co scope, simplicity, uh, simplicity, fruitfulness, as something like the rational backbone of theory of paradigm choice. But remember also that Kuhn notes that different scientists rank and interpret these values in different ways. And this makes consistency part of a complicated mix of values rather than the absolute touchstone. It is thus not obvious that one can subsume Kuhn's account under von Frasen's stratified picture. Another alternative to von Frasen's treating consistency and other traditional epistemic values as sacrosanct comes from feminist epistemology, namely Helen Longino, who emphasizes the importance of empirical adequacy, novelty of theoretical framework, heterogeneity, reciprocity of interaction, alleviation of human needs or decentralization of power as important values. And Longino is adamant that novelty of theoretical framework, quote, is contrary to the value of consistency with theories in other domains as described by Kuhn or conservatism that is preserving as much of one's prior belief set as possible, unquote. Nongino also insists that, quote, the normative claim, unquote, of a given set of values, quote, is limited to the community sharing the primary goal. And one such goal, one that's most dear to her heart, is, quote, dismantling the oppression and subordination of women, unquote. Feierabend would, of course, be happy to side with Longino. Gaines' method extensively rails against the so-called consistency condition. That is the idea that a new scientific theory must be consistent with existing theories or observations. Feierabend also proclaims that, quote, there is not a single science or form of life that is useful, progressive, as well as in agreement with logical demands. Other philosophers also differ with von Frasen when it comes to thinking about rationality. Von Frasen recognizes as much when he mentions grand priests, quote from von Frasen. What if I detect a straightforward contradiction in someone's beliefs, conclude that he has sabotaged himself in the management of his opinions, and he turns out to be grand priest? Priest happily admits to believing that certain contradictions are or may be true. Von Frasen responds by saying that priest logic is, quote, quite different from the one most familiar to us, unquote, and that evolutionary arguments might ultimately speak against it. I'm not convinced. 
Priest argues that consistency is a matter of degree and must always be weighed against other cognitive values, such as simplicity, unity, explanatory power, or parsimony. And it's not obvious that and how evolutionary arguments would work against Priest's proposal. Let me also take a further comparison, which is essential in my book, namely the comparison with elements of the strong program in the sociology of knowledge. Prima facie, the Edinburgh School of Sociology also has a stratified conception of rationality. The two strata are the natural rationality identified by psychologists and the normative cultural rationality studied by, the social, by social scientists. Thus both von Frasen and SSK opt, if you like, for something of a bifurcation concerning rationality. This allows both of them to have something of a stable though minimalist backdrop of rationality, a backdrop against which differences can be accounted for. But note, in SSK, the border between the psychological and the social is fluid, and the psychological can be overridden by the sociological or the social. This reduces the scope of the lower stratum and makes it much more flexible and variable. And this puts SSK much more at the radical end of voluntarism. Not to forget, of course, that SSK's perspective on rationality is primarily descriptive explanatory, not normative evaluative. So when Bluer would be confronted with von Frasen's basic norm, probably his response would be something like this, with a quote from Wittgenstein. The danger here, I believe, is one of giving a justification of our procedure where there is no such thing as a justification and we ought simply have said that's how we do it. Now, remember von Frasen's distinction between objectifying and voluntarist epistemology and that this in, in how that introduces a new dividing line in epistemology. The distinction, you will recall, covers conflicting answers to two different questions. Should epistemology be closely intertwined with the sciences of the day? And should core universal absolute epistemology have a wide scope? That is, should it leave few, if any, areas of the epistemic realm unconstrained? Objectifying epistemology in Van Frasen's book responds with yes to both questions. Voluntarist epistemology answers no to both questions. Surprisingly enough, von Frasen seems not to have noticed that there are two further options, yes to A and no to B, or no to A and yes to B. In other words, an epistemology entangled with the sciences, but with a narrow scope, and an epistemology distant from the sciences, but with a wide scope. The latter conception is close to mainstream epistemology, it seems to me, in the tradition of Chisholm and Gettier. The former is near to naturalized epistemology in the tradition of Goldman, Quine, or even SSK. And it seems to me that from Frasen's oversight matters for his argument. The fact that objectifying epistemology fails his litmus test of saving the rationality of scientific revolutions does not uniquely speak in favor of voluntarist epistemology. Mainstream epistemology or narrow scope and naturalized epistemology might also make the cut. Now, von Frasen deserves credit for reflecting on the role of epistemologies in scientific revolutions. And it seems eminently plausible that when such revolutions occur, epistemology changes too. Firearmed, in fact, long ago in the Gaines Method, gave a detailed case study of how epistemology, how epistemology changed during the Copernican Revolution. And yet, even during the Copernican Revolution, of course, many epistemic practices and principles remained stable. Um, changes concern questions like who is a reliable testifier? Are instruments like telescopes essential for producing knowledge? or what are the standards of scientific proof, or are biblical texts literally true? Other epistemic notions did not change. For example, epistemic notions about the perceptual appearance 
of close medium sized objects in broad daylight. Additionally, it seems a fair guess that the epistemic ideas prevalent in a given historical period do not form a coherent whole. Different coexisting groups differ in some of their epistemic ideas, and even the epistemic conceptions of one and the same group often contain contradictions. This epistemic disunity and uneven effect of revolutions on, on epistemologies further weaken von Frasen's argument for voluntarist epistemology. Because von Frasen assumes that the main alternative to voluntarist epistemology is to think of scientific revolutions as involving a clash between two unified and consistent epistemologies, each tied to its paradigm, whose respective defenders cannot by render each other as wholly irrational. It is to avoid this result that according to Van Frasen, we need voluntarist epistemology with its minimalist commitment. But the mere fact that some part of an objectifying epistemology is incompatible with a given revolutionary change need not result in the respective epistemologists overall verdict that this revolutionary change is irrational. Von Frasen reduces rationality and epistemology to a small set of prescriptions. The less content to rationality or epistemology, his thought is, the less there is for a revolution to contra contradict. But to me, that seems to jar with the goals of the philosophy of science. Do we really want an epistemology that is so minimalist prescriptive as to not connect up with our best science? How could it not be so connected up? Isn't in fact the acceptance of every methodology always the acceptance of an epistemic inductive principle or practice? Von Frasen faces a dilemma here. If he makes epistemology so uh, thick enough high resolution enough so that it can say something illuminating about scientific work, and clearly this is something from Frasen wants, then the epistemology will change when science changes, and the change might well look irrational or absurd. But if from Frasen makes epistemology thin enough, low resolution enough, so that it remains unchanged across scientific revolutions, then it will be unable to say much of interest about scientific work. Or to put it still differently, do we really want to sacrifice the project of a high resolution epistemology of science on the altar of the credo, rationality doesn't change? How reassuring is it to be told, forte voce, rationality is stable, when it is added sotto voce, of course, only in a very minimalist sense of rational. On the final topic of scientific revolutions, I'd like to make five observations. Um, first, Van Frasen points the following rough picture of the unfolding of a scientific revolution. Problems mount for the old paradigm or stance. Scientists increasingly doubt that they can make it work. They fall into despair. They encounter a new, initially absurd paradigm. Um, and then an emotion like impulse enables them to reconceptualize this alternative as a life object. It's a bit unfortunate here that the only example of such impulse is a Sartrean emotion, even though Van Frasen also says this is only one case of such an impulse. Moreover, as it stands, the impulses needed for scientific revolutions are specified wholly functionally. An impulse is whatever it needs to constitute life options for theory choice. But is it obvious that this functional role can only be played by webs? I'm not convinced. Remember as an example, Greta of the Samsa family. Did it really need an emotion to make her and her parents realize that the beetle was replacing rather than embodying Gregor? Could the same effect not also have been achieved by, say, 
a philosophical argument that undermines belief in personal identity across change of species. Second, consider, for instance, how Van Frasen replies to Ernest McMullen's objection that in Galileo's writings, one nowhere finds the despair Van Frasen deems a defining feature of scientific revolutions. Van Frasen answers, quote, I had never really stopped to ask myself whether Galileo had suffered the sort of epistemic despair that I was describing. The absurdity was, it seems to me, a point of logic, unquote. And I'm asking myself, isn't this a point where philosophy of science runs, rides roughshod over the history of science? Third, note also that von Frasen's key thought that scientific revolutions involve reinterpretations of key methodological principles is not really supported by his key source for this idea. The emphasis on stability is missing in the text by Feyerabend, classical empiricism, upon which Van Frasen purports to build. Feyerabend is arguing that the early modern sola experientia, like its contemporary sola scriptura, was, quote, vacuous, unquote. It had a clear meaning only for those who already thought that experience or scripture was important, only for those who rendered experience or scripture in similar ways, and only for those who concurred on how to experience, uh, on how experience or scripture could be a source of knowledge. But a community who agreed on so much did not actually need the slogan. Accordingly, it merely, he says, Feyerabend says, it merely reinforced an already existing faith. It was no more than a party line. Von Frasen, of course, wishes to avoid the reduction of sola experientia to a vacuous slogan. But then the question is, by what argument? Fourth, um, the central goal to defend the rationality of scientific revolutions remains unclear since Van Frasen does not offer enough discussion of progress. Remember that most historians of science are now skeptical of whether, um, of whether there are or were Kuhnian scientific revolutions. True, some philosophers think otherwise, but historians seem to me to have the better empirical grounding here. And finally, fifth, perhaps von Frasen is misled by the assumption that the best argument in favor of voluntarism in the theory of rationality and in epistemology has to run through a certain understanding of scientific revolutions. Why does the argument have to be so complicated? Are there no other ways to motivate skepticism vis-a-vis -vis naturalized epistemology? Are there no other means to defend the idea of a narrow scope conception of rationality and epistemology? Why aren't the historical and cultural differences in what has been and is regarded as rational and epistemically justified good enough? Okay, I conclude. Um, voluntary constructive empiricism, if I'm right, falls within the relativist spectrum. But it has its problems, but reflecting on them can be constructive. Elements that seem to me important and worth preserving and worthy of further development are the stance idea, both, on, both in first order philosophy and in meta philosophy, that is in application to relativism itself. I also find important the reflection on voluntarism and related to it reflections on the scope of epistemology in philosophy of science. I am much less impressed as I tried to bring out with Van Frasen's account of scientific revolutions and his insistence of a, on a rather moderate version of voluntarism. To get clear on relativism and philosophy of science, I also tried to make plausible, it is worth revisiting or reinterpreting influential positions against the relativist spectrum. And why do it? 
to give sense of to give a sense of what humans can hope to achieve cognitively and to get rid of theological absolutist residues in our thinking. Thank you very much. <laughs>